What's up guys, it's Danny from Geeks of Doom, and we are back with the MCU rewatch, counting down to Black Widow on May 7th, and we are just about done with phase one, because we are at the last film before the Avengers, it's Captain America, the first Avenger. This movie came out in 2011, like Thor, was directed by Joe Johnston, and was the first MCU film written by the screenwriting duo of Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. Those two guys would go on to do a few films more in the MCU. Uh, they did both of the other Cap films, Winter Soldier and Civil War, and then they did Infinity War and Endgame. They also, in the middle of all that, created Agent Carter. Uh, so yeah, they played a pretty substantial role uh, in the writing phase of the MCU. So, in my Thor review, I mentioned how one of my favorite parts of Thor was just how different it felt than the other MCU movies uh, at that point. You had Iron Man, modern times, uh, you know, then you had the Hulk, Incredible Hulk, and Iron Man 2, and they kind of followed a formula already by that point. And then you had Thor, which whisked you away to Asgard and introduced you to all this cosmic energy and beautiful colors. And then comes Captain America. And Captain America does the opposite. Instead of taking you off to this magical world of color and you know, vibrance, it takes you back in time. Uh, Disney Plus does this wonderful thing where they put the MCU in chronological order and you can watch it in order, not of release date, but in order of timeline. Captain America is the, the first Avenger, is the first MCU in the timeline. This movie takes place from beginning until the very end during World War II. Uh, in fact, the movie starts just like with Thor, uh, this movie starts in Tonsberg, Norway. Uh, why is that important? Because again, the continuity of this uh, 23 film series, Tonsberg, Norway is where Thor would create new Asgard in Avengers Endgame after uh, Thor Ragnarok, which again, we'll get to much later on. Uh, we meet Johann Schmidt, played by... Hugo Weaving, and he is looking for the Tesseract. And he's digging around, and he finds this beautiful wall uh, with the tree that Thor had described to Selvig, and he finds the Tesseract, and we know that he's a member of Hydra. This is like an offshoot of the Nazi party. And he has this great line where he says to another Hydra member, let the Fuhrer uh, dig for trinkets in the desert. And I kind of felt like that was a, a kind of a throwaway jab. Not maybe not a jab, but poke fun at Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones, because that whole movie is about how Hitler is obsessed with the occult and he's digging in the desert looking for the Ark of the Covenant. So maybe I'm just reading too much into that. Johann Schmidt, of course, we will find out later on, is the Red Skull, a villain who is incredibly important to Marvel Comics, to Captain America. And a lot of people were not very happy with the Red Skull in this movie. I like the Red Skull. I do have some issues with how he works in this movie and how Hydra is portrayed in this movie, but we'll get to those later. We then jump to Brooklyn. That's where I am right now. We jump to Brooklyn in the early 40s and Steve Rogers, puny little <laughs> computerized Chris Evans head on uh, Chris Evans head on a uh, body. Uh, <laughs> it the special effect doesn't look as bad as I think it it felt like it looked weird back when you saw this movie in the theater, but it really doesn't look too bad. Uh, for scrawny Chris Evans. Uh, and he is desperate to join the war effort. He wants to fight, but he's got a litany of problems. 
and he draws the attention of Stanley Tucci's character. Uh, Stanley Tucci is uh, a scientist who is working with S.H.I.E.L.D. on a, a super soldier serum uh, that enhances all of your normal abilities to make you into this absolute super soldier. And he sees Chris Evans, even though he has a frail body, that he has a great soul and he's a great man. He has this great speech with him about how he's a great man. Stanley Tucci's character in this movie reminded me a lot of Yinsen, the scientist who helped Tony build the, uh, the original Iron Man suit in the cave in, in Iron Man. Uh, he's basically there to drive the plot, to help the hero become the hero, and then to die and give the hero their, their kind of like mission, you know, become a, you know, Yinsen tells Tony, use this suit to become a better man. Stanley Tucci's character literally tells Steve, you know, to become a greater man. So it, it, they kind of, they feel like they're two peas of the same pod. Uh, eventually, of course, it's an origin story, of course, and uh, Hydra right after they see the proof of concept where Steve does in fact survive the procedure, he, he gets the super soldier serum and he becomes Captain America, uh, Hydra tries to blow everything up and we get to see some of Cap's first powers. I love the scenes where Steve is just figuring out how to use his powers and he's never ran fast before in his life, so he doesn't even know how to control his body, he ends up flying through a window. Uh, but this movie works so well, just like with Thor, just like with Thor where it was Chris Hemsworth and Tom Hiddleston's charm that drove the movie. In this movie, it's Chris Evans' charm. He is, he's so perfectly cast. And it's, it's hard to believe because when, I remember in 2011 when, or earlier than 2011, when we heard that Chris Evans was being cast as Captain America, a lot of people's reaction was, wait a minute. He's already Human Torch in Fantastic Four. That's right. Those movies exist. And he was great in those movies. He was fun in those movies. But it was this movie and it was this character that turned him into a superstar. As usual, my cats are going crazy. Um, and it's, it's all the little things. It's, you know, him pre-Super Soldier Serum, you know, we get the introduction of the, I can do this all day. Uh, we get his relationship with Bucky, played by Sebastian Stan, who, again, probably didn't realize back in 2011 when he was playing Bucky Barnes in Captain America First Avenger that a decade later we would be eagerly awaiting his new series, which debuts tomorrow on Disney+, Plus, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So can't wait for that. Uh, hard to believe it's been a decade of Sebastian Stan pretty much playing this character. Haley Atwell as Agent Carter, so great in this movie, and her chemistry with Chris Evans is mm, palpable. Like, the casting of these movies, you know, we joke around about how, yeah, Edward Norton replaced, Terrence Howard replaced, we get that. But Gwyneth Paltrow and Robert Downey Jr. have perfect chemistry as a couple. You believe them as a couple in the Iron Man films. You believe that there is this deep-rooted tension, you know, sexual tension and, and true love almost, as corny as that sounds, between Chris Evans, Captain America, Steve Rogers, and Haley Atwell's Peggy Carter. You really do. They're, they're so adorable on screen together, especially after she catches him uh, after he gets kind of jumped by Natalie Dormer uh, and is caught making out with her, uh, Agent Carter f tests the vibranium of his shield by shooting him, which I thought was, it just never stops being funny. Uh, I love, I I'm a history teacher, first and foremost. I love, and, and I know this is, this is a, point of, a point of contention for a lot of people with this film, is that it's light on action and that when there's action, it's in montage form. And I get that, but the history teacher in me loves 
the way that Captain America is brought in. I love the propaganda, uh, the USO shows, the selling of war bonds. That is so perfect. It's exactly how the U.S. government would use uh, a genuine super soldier like Captain America. Why risk having your one super soldier killed when you can use him to sell war bonds and encourage more regular people who are not super soldiers to join the military. I love that he spends half the movie punching Hitler, which is of course a nod to Captain Jesus, which is a nod to Captain America, uh, the very first comic where he's punching Hitler on the cover. Uh, that was back in 1941, so I love those nods. And yeah, I you know, he puts his team together and I love his team. Uh, and, and again, there's all these little hints, continuity hints back to phase one, uh, Spider-Man Homecoming again. We saw this with The Incredible Hulk where Martin Starr played a, a computer nerd in Incredible Hulk and then he's Mr. Harrington. Well, here Jim Morita plays one of the members of Cap's team, and you have that that character's you know, Jim Morita, uh, the cat. That character is a relative of the principal in Spider-Man: Homecoming. Uh, so I, there's these, these little continuity things that continue to be great. Um, let's talk a little bit about Red Skull, because again, Red Skull is a super important villain to Marvel Comics in general, to Captain America as a character, and a lot of people had issues with Hugo Weaving in this film. I don't. I really like uh, Johann Schmidt slash uh, the Red Skull. I like that he, he had Stanley Tucci's super serum and he, you know, used it on himself and it enhanced him, and you know he it, he burned. He says he you know he he knows what it's like to burn, and so we, when he finally meets Captain America later, that that great scene where they're on top of these beams as the Hydra base is exploding, and he's like Captain America, finally we meet, and he reveals he rips his his mask off. It's this great moment, it, it, and it, it should be remembered as a better moment, but I think it's a combination of things. I know for a fact Hugo Weaving did not like the makeup job he hated, and I think that when he was asked about possibly coming back, he just didn't want to go through the makeup process again, and, and he had no interest in coming back for a sequel, so that kind of wrote him out. The big problem with the Red Skull is not a problem with him necessarily. It's this whole movie, Hydra is just, and this is a this is a flaw that we will see in other MCU movies, is very often you have your villain, and then the villain is surrounded by hordes upon hordes of nameless, faceless goons who are just there to be shot and killed and beaten and destroyed by the heroes. And basically, you have Hydra using the Tesseract, which contains an Infinity Stone, mind you. We don't really know that yet, but it's there. And they're using that power to create these weapons that can basically incinerate you if you get hit with one. And Cap's team just takes them all out like, you know, gunshot, boom, 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 they're done. And so Red Skull spends most of the movie like coming up with these plans for all of his weapons and then turning and running. In fact, the climactic scene of the film is basically Red Skull running from Captain America to his plane. He runs to his plane two different times, including the, the climax where he ends up on the 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 jet with Captain America containing the bombs that Cap, of course, has to take down over the ice. Um, I do like that the Red Skull, of course, not about this film, but I like that retroactively we learn that his fate was not just to die at the hands of the Tesseract, but rather that the Tesseract 
basically, you know, he was punished for his, uh, <laughs> he was punished for his uh, desire to control it. And he was sent to Vormir to basically preside over the Soul Stone. And we find that out. We don't find that out really until Infinity War. I believe it is. Yeah, Infinity War. And then we see him again in Endgame. But I remember watching Infinity War in the movie theater. And when you see the Red Skull on Vormir, it's like, wow, holy shit. Um, but yeah, it. I just feel like they didn't give the Red Skull, they didn't make him threatening enough. They, they had his motivations down. They had his desire to get revenge on Captain America down. They just didn't make him threatening enough. Because every time there's a big scene involving him, it's Hydragoons being defeated, and then him and uh, Emil's, uh, him and Zola, played by Toby Jones, basically turning and running away. Um, and that that was disappointing to me because I love Hugo Weaving, even though I now love his niece even more, Samara. Uh, she's the best, and she needs to make more movies because I love everything she's in. Uh, I didn't mention Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones is in the MCU, plays, uh, you know, that Phillips, the head of the military uh, training. He, he's looking for a candidate for the super serum with Stanley Tucci's character. And they, you know, he doesn't want to go with Steve, but he resigns himself to go with Steve. And then, you know, the movie ends with, Steve having to crash the, the jet in in the, the water. They freeze. The Tesseract ends up at the bottom of the ocean. We find out in like the end credits slash post credits that you got to hear this noise. This just It's two kittens chasing each other around the house, just destroying everything. I'm not going to have anything left soon. It's, it's amazing. But uh, they, they, the movie ends with Cap. Uh, basically, he's woken up. The Tesseract is recovered. Uh, we also meet, of course, uh, Howard Stark. And this movie is played by Dominic West, uh, who does, I think, a pretty good job in this movie. And him and Haley Atwell as... You know, Howard Stark and Peggy Carter. Of course, we find out that they're two of the founding members of S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, we find that out much later on. Uh, Hank Pym, of course, would be a founding member. We'd find uh, a lot more about that in uh, Ant-Man and then Endgame. So this movie does help set up a lot. Uh, I like it as a historical film. I like it as, you know, so many of the, you know, nods to one of the first great Marvel characters, you know, uh, Captain America, 1941, punching Hitler on the comics. Uh, yeah, it's a little weak in the villain department, not because of the villain, just because of how that villain is treated. I don't mind the montages for the action. I think this is a rare case where the movie is about setting up Captain America as a, as a, character and less about watching him do his, you know, superhero stuff. It's less about him doing the fighting than it is about Steve Rogers becoming Captain America. Uh, and I think that Chris Evans himself really handles that. Uh, we all, you know, we also skipped over a great train sequence where, uh, Bucky is presumed to die, and that, of course, is going to pay off again films and films and films later in Captain America Civil War. Uh, well, uh, what am I talking about? Captain America Winter Soldier and then Civil War. And yeah, great stuff. The way that they tie all that back together. And like I said, here we are. It's a decade later, and uh, I'm sitting here getting ready for Captain America... Uh, for for Falcon and the Winter Soldier in 2021 on Disney+. Plus. So, Captain America First Avenger, it's probably the most nondescript of the uh, Phase 1 Marvel films just because of its subject matter. 
it's probably the one with the least amount of total action, what we consider to be action. There's not a lot of the explosions. There's not a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat, considering it's a war movie. And despite that, I still enjoy this movie. I think it's an easy, again, easy watch. Two hour, a little bit more than two hours long. Uh, and it sets up perfectly for the Avengers. Captain America waking up in the modern times, meeting Nick Fury, and we're off and running to the Avengers. My son and I just finished watching the Avengers again, and that video will be up very soon. Uh, that is the last of the pre-Avengers Phase 1 movies. Uh, we'll cover the Avengers next. Then it's onward to Phase 2. And we are inching closer to May 7th. Might have to take a day off here and there or else we'll get there too quickly. But Falcon and the Winter Soldier starts on Disney Plus also. So you can stay tuned. Uh, we'll probably cover a few episodes of that here on Geeks of Doom as well. And until then, this is Danny, and we will see you very soon.